Hello, everybody. I appreciate you stopping by to hear what this video is about, to see what this video is about. That actually just gives me um, great encouragement that you want to hear the word of God. Okay, you want to know the mind of God. You want to know what is going on in our world today and how should we move forward as things are getting more serious things are percolating times have changed life has not been the same ever since 2020 but it's okay there's no reason to fear. If anything, we should be getting excited because our King, our Lord and our God, the Redeemer and the Lover of our soul is on His way. Things are gonna get more challenging especially for us Christians, for us believers. It's going to get more harder. But we cannot wave the white flag. We cannot throw in the towel. We must remain the course. I agree with Pastor Lewis in his last message where he says, if I live, I'm going to be a testimony. If I die, I'm going to be a testimony. In the end, we still win. What I'm about to share with you now is from a wonderful preacher, wonderful man of God, sound biblical teacher, goes by the name of John MacArthur. Um, he's preaching out of Grace Community Church, I believe it is. Excuse me. Let me just take a look to make sure. Grace Community Church. I believe that's in California. And I put together a couple of excerpts from his last message, which is titled, When Government Rewards Evil and Punishes Good. Okay, that was posted by Grace to You. Grace to You is the YouTube channel name. And that was on June 17, 2021. I had actually linked this video um, in my last video description area box. So I will do it again. If you didn't watch it, I'm encouraging you. Please, please, please. I'm encouraging you. And, and I don't do this. I don't think I will. Yeah, very seldom do I um, encourage anyone to check out a video, to check out a message. Um, very seldom, you know. But in this situation, in this case, I implore you, go listen to it in its entirety. I've listened to this message about three times. Um, And it's, it's a great, great reminder of what's going on and why is it happening. And then it's a great reminder of, okay, so what is the outcome of, of, of all that's happening? What is to come out of this? And then it's a great reminder of, yes, I remember now. Because in the end, our king is to return. And when he do, every knee shall bow every tongue listen to me good listen to me real good every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord thanks for watching I give God all the glory and all the praise I take nothing no credit from this. 
because God gave this man of God, who you're about to hear from next, the message, the word, the encouragement, and the truth. God bless you. Continue to live on purpose. But it has to be godly purpose. Because if it's not, you're on the wrong side. And you're going to lose. I've obviously tried to address through the last year and a half almost of the issues that confront us in the country that we live in, in the world that we live in, in the times that we live in. But I thought there's one final message that I would like to, to lay upon you, and that's what's come together this morning. It has many components and many parts, and uh, it may uh, test your attention span a little bit. Um, when we first decided to meet as a church, it's been a year now, and uh, to do that without regard to what the government was telling us to do, there was a lot of criticism. Uh, that criticism came from evangelical leaders, pastors, bloggers, writers, friends, foes, just about everywhere. But we were, we were not dissuaded in any sense from doing what we did. And the Lord has uh, demonstrated to us that we were lied to. I think whatever the issues are in the world, the church is the only hope of the world. Now, I, I want to see if I can't, from the Word of God, pull together some things that will help you to understand why this is our position. And I want this because I think in the future, for those who are younger than I am, maybe I'll live to see some of it. Uh, this resolve to be the church when the government wants to shut you down is going to be tested again. And it's going to be tested at a much more aggressive level. There were many churches that failed this test, and there will be many who will fail the next one. But the true church follows Christ, not the government. Our president said in the last month that the greatest threat to America, he said on one occasion, is systemic racism, which doesn't exist. He said white supremacy, which doesn't exist with any power. And then he said global warming. which doesn't exist either, <laughs> and if it does, God's in charge of it. In reality, the greatest threat to this nation is the government, the government. And I want to show you how we are to understand that. Turn to Romans 13. Romans 13. Listen carefully to what the Apostle Paul said. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it doesn't bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil." 
The role of the government is to restrain evil. And when it functions to restrain evil, it is fulfilling its God-ordained purpose. Please notice in verses 1 and 2 that government is from God, by God, of God. It is designed as a necessary restraint in a world of sinners. Verses 3 and 4 tell us it is not a threat to those whose behavior is good but evil. It is those who do evil who should be afraid, not those who do good. In fact, it offers praise to those who do good and brings wrath on those who do evil. And rulers actually, according to verse 6, are servants of God, devoted to that service. This is God's design for government. The problem is when government ceases to function by God's design, it yields up its authority. The same would be true in a family. God's design is that the Father lead the family. When the Father leads in a destructive and evil way, He yields up the right to exercise that God-given authority. And by the way, just as a footnote, the man who wrote that, the Apostle Paul, was in violation of the government more often than any other person in the entire New Testament. And when he went to preach the gospel, he was very often thrown in jail, and ultimately he was executed by the government that he refused to obey when it no longer functioned to protect good behavior and punish evil behavior. A second passage, 1 Peter chapter 2. And verses 13 and 14 will suffice, I think. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him, by the Lord, for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. There again, we are to submit for the Lord's sake. What do you mean, the Lord's sake? When the government is doing what the Lord designed it to do, when government turns the divine design on its head and protects those who do evil and makes those who do good afraid, it forfeits its divine purpose. In our world today, rulers are designing a culture that protects the immoral. It even has reached the point where it desires to protect criminals and makes those who do good afraid. When the criminals are unrestrained because they don't fear the consequences, but the police are restrained because they fear the consequences of stopping criminals, you know everything is turned on its head. Our government is the source of lies and the protector of liars and the enemy of those who speak the truth. It praises the evil 
and persecutes the good. So God's design for government has been entirely corrupted. As these divinely designed spheres of control in human society descend into chaos, the government will cease to function the way God designed it, and in fact, it will become the enemy of the divine design. It will turn everything upside down. It will become the punisher of those who do good. Now I want you to understand that there's some supernatural reasons why this is happening. They're not political, they're not even social in the fullest measure. If you go back to 1 John and uh, reconnect with the passage from last week. 1 John 2, 15 to 17, we read, "'Do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him.'" Then verse 16, "'For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever.'" The world is the enemy of God. The enemy of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The world is the enemy of Scripture. The world is the enemy of the gospel. The world is the enemy of the church. What do we mean by the world? Well, remember last week I talked about the world as the complex of evil. The word is cosmos, it means a system. The complex of evil works against what is good. So you have government, which is a part of the world, trying to restrain the world of which it is a part. Very hard for it to hold together because it's all part of the same system. The complex of evil works everywhere, and the government is no exception because the very evil people given the responsibility to restrain evil are themselves incapable of being without evil. That makes enough problems. We have a human system made up of evil, sinful people trying to control a culture of evil, sinful people. The potential for breakdown is inevitable, and it has been demonstrated historically. That's why the Bible says the world gets worse and worse, evil men get worse and worse as time goes on. But there's something more than just that. There's something more than just the human complex of sinners trying to restrain sin which in the end is a losing effort. There's something more that we have to face, and that's in 1 John 5.19, and I want you to look at it. 1 John 5.19, we know that we are of God. We believers are of God. And then this very, very important statement, and that the whole world lies in literally in the evil one. The whole world is in the control of the evil one. It isn't just that everybody is sinful, it is that there is an evil supernatural power, the evil one. Who is this archenemy of God, this evil one. Listen to John 12, 31, where Jesus speaks of the devil and says, He is the ruler of this world. And then again in John 14 and verse 30, He calls the devil 
the ruler of this world. And then again in chapter 16, verse 11, for the third time, the ruler of this world. And in Ephesians 2, 2, He is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit working in the sons of disobedience. So you have Satan, who is the world ruler, who operates in the system and, listen carefully, in the people. The whole world is in His kingdom. John 8, 44, you're of your father, the devil. And Satan is in them in the sense that he can attach his devious, evil deception to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, and that way exercise influence over them. He is the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, who blinds minds. And Paul says in Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood humanity, but against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. It's always in the power of monarchs to do damage to the people of God, always. That is why Proverbs 16, 12 says it is an abomination for kings to commit wickedness because it turns everything upside down. Only in righteousness is a throne established. Look, in Acts chapter 4, the Jewish leaders said to the apostles, stop preaching. In Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar said, stop worshiping. Again in Daniel 6, we didn't read it, the ruler said, stop praying or we're going to throw you into what? Lion's den. The governor of California says, stop singing, stop hugging. But God's people don't stop because no, listen to me, no human authority is absolute. No human authority is absolute. I'll say it again, no human authority is absolute. All human authorities are only authorities as long as they function in the way God designed them. And when they don't function that way anymore, but they turn it on its head and do it in the reverse form, they yield up that God-given authority. Obviously the fallout is horrendous. Trust us, said government, we truly have your best interests at heart. All we want to do is help keep you safe. Government has already become the purveyor of wickedness. Government is a murderer, slaughtering millions of infants in abortion, elevating the LGBTQ agenda, the bizarre transgender deception. The culture has become anti-truth. We all know that. The truth is the biggest threat to lies. William Pitt, well-known name in English history said this, necessity, i.e. public health, common good, is the plea of every infringement of human freedom. It is the argument of tyrants. Get people afraid and they'll do whatever you want. A fearful society will always comply. Panicking people will believe anything. During the gruesome and bloody days of the French Revolution when 40,000 innocent people lost their heads, you would be interested to know who was operating the guillotine, the Committee for Public Safety. (laughs) 
One writer says, "'Governments now get voted into power by promising to oversee housing, education, medicine, the economy, the currency, the minimum income, food, water, land, and the list goes on. The government becomes a parent and the citizens are dependents. The government in this role becomes a monstrous juggernaut of bureaucracy, devouring taxes and trying to regulate every detail of life. And they definitely want to regulate the church and silence its proclamation. Prime Minister of the Netherlands from 1901 to 1905 was a man named Abraham Kuyper, quite an amazing man. In his book, The Glorious Body of Christ, Kuyper wrote, "'Our age is one of ecclesiastical passivism. When a church ceases to be militant, it also ceases to be a church of Jesus Christ. A truly militant church stands opposed to the world both without its walls and within. Time and again in its history, the church has found it necessary to assert its sovereignty over against usurpations by the state." And Kuiper gave some biblical examples, like when King Saul or King Isaiah usurped the priesthood, stating, "'In both cases, a representative of the state was severely punished for encroaching on the sovereignty of the church.'" Lord Macaulay of England summed up the Puritan reputation this way. He said of the Puritans, "'He bowed himself in the dust before his Maker as he set his foot on the neck of his king.'" Kuiper says, ours is an age of state totalitarianism. All over the world, statism is rising. In consequence, in many lands, the church finds itself utterly at the mercy of the state whose mercy often proves cruelty, while in others the notion is rapidly gaining ground that the church exists and operates by the state's permission. We do not operate by the state's permission. We operate by the Lord's command. Francis Schaeffer, who died in 1984, says, if there's no final place for civil disobedience, then the government has been made autonomous, and as such, it has been put in the place of the living God. And that point is exactly when the early Christians performed their acts of civil disobedience, even when it cost them their lies. Acts of state which contradict God's laws are illegitimate and acts of tyranny. Tyranny is ruling without the sanction of God. To resist tyranny is to honor God. The bottom line is that at a certain point, there is not only the right but the duty to disobey the state. G.K. Chesterton once made this observation, "'It is only by believing in God that we can ever criticize the government. Once abolish God and the government becomes God. Wherever the people do not believe in something beyond the government, they will worship it. They will worship the strongest thing in the world. John Calvin said, we're subject to the men who rule over us, but subject only in the Lord. If they command anything against Him, let us not pay the least regard to it, nor be moved by all the dignity which they possess as magistrates. Now, Scottish Covenanters, amazing people. Andrew Melville was jailed in the Tower of London for the gospel. He was actually jailed because he confronted King James of the King James Bible. This is what Melville said, "'There are two kings and two kingdoms in Scotland. There is King James, the head of the commonwealth, and there is King Jesus, the head of the church. Whose subject King James is, and of whose kingdom he is not the head, nor a lord, but only a member." For that he was jailed. In 1660, the Covenanters signed their national covenant with their blood. Historian S. M. Houghton tells they were determined, quoting, to resist to the death the claims of the King, to override the crown rights of the Redeemer in His church, King Jesus. Their national covenant gave high honor to the eternal God and His most holy Word, demands the faithful preaching of that Word, the due and right ministration of the sacraments, 
The subscribers further say that they fear neither the foul aspersions of rebellion, combination, or what else our adversaries from their craft and malice would put upon us, seeing what we do is so well warranted and arises from an unfeigned desire to maintain the true worship of God, the majesty of our King, and the peace of His kingdom for the common happiness of ourselves and our posterity. They pledge themselves as in the sight of God to be good examples to others of all godliness, soberness, and righteousness in every duty we owe to God and man." Does government win? Does Satan win? No, because in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, Jesus comes back, right, and destroys all kings set against Him. Battle of Armageddon, He wipes them out. Listen to Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. This is what the rulers of the world do. And they say, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then He will speak to them in His anger and terrify them in His fury, saying, But as for Me, I have installed My King upon Zion, My holy mountain." The King is coming, isn't He? I will tell you the decree of the Lord. He said to Me, You're My Son, today I have begotten you. Ask of Me, and I'll surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You will break those nations with a rod of iron. You will shatter them like clay pots. Therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that He not become angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. A warning to the leaders of this nation and every nation. The King is coming. He will crush all opposition. Satan persecutes the church through governments. But the Son of God has come to destroy the devil, to render him powerless to overthrow Satan's final kingdom of darkness. In conclusion, Romans 8.31, if God be for us, let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the confidence that we have born to our souls from Your precious truth, Your Word. Thank You for these dear people. Thank You for their faithfulness, for their love for You, for the love wrought in their hearts by You and thus for You. Thank You for the joy of fellowship. Give us such joy as we understand that what's coming is all going to be for Your glory. Everything in history is unfolding in the plan that You have designed. Your purposes cannot be thwarted. You will triumph. Christ will come. He will destroy His enemies. He will destroy all kings and all rulers and reign alone in His glorious kingdom of which we who love Him will be a part. We long for that day. Until then, may we celebrate with joy and thanksgiving that we even now are citizens of that kingdom, and we who know Him and love Him will reign with Him. We thank You for that promise. May we never become discouraged by what's happening in the world. May we understand that it's exactly what Scripture says we would expect. Help us not get caught up in the politics of these things, but rather to see them through the lens of Holy Scripture. We know that the devil has a plan, but so do you, and you will triumph. You are triumphing even now at Grace Church, and we are basking in a preview 
of Your final triumph. We thank You for that sweet gift of grace. Bring to Yourself any with us today who don't know Christ. Draw that soul into Your kingdom. For Your glory we pray, amen.